Hello, everyone. This is Leilani Cawthon, the CEO of Learning Council News Media and Research. Glad to have you with us today. This is the Edu Jedi Leadership Society and Learning Council's Edu Jedi Awards 2021. Um, we've done two big national surveys this year one with administrators and one with teachers. We have a tremendous amount of news to share with you. And then we're gonna feature a whole lot of our award levels winners during the course of this day. So you can hear from all of them and then there's gonna be a flurry of news releases about the winners and the data out of the survey. We're gonna use this uh, first hour to tell you um, some, but not all of the results of the survey. It's just too much data to fit in even to an hour um, we want you to take a break at any time. Keep your browser tab open for the event and come back. Um, you can also ask questions, make comments anytime. Just raise your little digital hand um, on the conference panel or type into chat or type into Q&A. Um, Doug Cawthon is here with me today. He will actually be monitoring that and alerting me if I miss it. Hopefully I don't miss it. <clears throat> Our sponsors for the national gathering this year, and unfortunately we couldn't be together, but we're hoping that we get to be together this next year again. Um, Classlink, Safari Montage, Blackboard, Scholastic, Digital Solutions, and D2L, Desire to Learn. So we're very grateful to them. Um, pay attention to them. Here's the way the day is gonna roll. This first hour again is the market briefing and awards announcements. Then we're gonna hear from our Edge Jedi Knights and Achievers. Um, and then it's the Educata Innovation in, or Innovators Awardees. There are four of them that we're going to showcase um, in that one hour. And then we'll hear from Classlink. They have won our Glowing Screen Award and also Safari, who won the Tech Imperative Award this year. And then our Mission Panel. Um, and then uh, the rest of the day is the Teacher Award Spotlights. From 120 to 2, we'll hear from Amy. Dr. Denise Griffin and Laura Lee Milberger. And then uh, we'll do some speed rounds with some of the feature technology that we pulled out from the market. They'll be um, doing some sharing and then some secret sauce presentations by uh, David Jarbo and then Rich Boatner. And we're gonna end our day with our good friends, um, Dr. Shannon Terry, Dr. Aaron English. Hello, and uh, Ellen Palmer, hi. Um, so those are that's the course of the day. It's going to be a jam-packed day. Um, so let's start off with um, the Survey of Markets Awards announcements. All right, so here's what happened in this past year. We had 21,098 educators respond to our surveys. Of those, 1,394 completed the full responses. The rest of them were really just entering for the survey awards. But the full responses would take, you know, it took about an hour just to respond um, to all of the data that we were asking for. The surveys were long and exhausting. We heard that from quite a few people, but really interesting because like every survey the Learning Council does, people learn uh, and they get ideas just from taking the survey. Um, so that was so, sort of what happened. We've kept the responses open from March 15th all the way to November 2nd before we started analyzing all the data. This is what we got back for demographics, schools and districts, more rural than we've ever seen before. It really tells you a lot about what happened in the country with the pandemic. Rural and suburban were really stepping up with technology deployment more than we've ever seen before. So just to give you some context, um, the Learning Council has shown in the series of our events, if you've met us when we were in your region and we were doing local events, um, you know we've always talked about how to mature in your digital transition. Well, this is a different way to look at it. Um, we're doing a paper right now with Promethean, and we sort of are, are looking at their data and our data together in that paper that will be coming out later in the year. Um, but to give you some context on maturity, just to sort of set the stage for all the rest of the data, um, device rollouts and various apps is normally step one. That's what almost everybody in the country that hadn't already done it was doing in the last um, two years. And then they get into just different teaching and learning methods and models down at the teacher level, playing with how they're gonna do things. Um, then there's a need for mass training and you normally start seeing a lot of that last year, almost every single person in America was trained on uh, web conferencing and a couple of other, you know, the mainstream apps. And then they, then they start saying, hey, we got too many apps, we need to retire some of them. Um, there's duplicatives ones and what are we doing? 
Um, and so they, then after that, they get into sort of an inventory of what exactly they're going to do and a more precise professional development. Um, then they start worrying again, which they worried usually about this earlier, on access and resource equity um, at a deeper level, making sure every student has the right app, the rostering is correct, and all that other stuff. And then they start thinking about services disaggregation because they may be seen like we saw in the last couple of years, a loss to homeschooling or other alternatives. And they say, hey, why don't we offer some of the homeschoolers the ability to do some of the courses, maybe in a disaggregated way, or we'll do some testing or we'll do um, various and sundry things with uh, use of our facilities. So that starts to go a much deeper. Then they worry about personalization for every single student. Um, and then beyond that, they get into how do we Uberize personalized path and pace for every single student. So they start now just aggregating from whole group and class structure, and they end up at the very end, and this is where pretty much we think the whole market is going, into being what we call an experiential center that is much more focused on leaning itself on the technology to distribute the bits and pieces of knowledge, and then layering in a much more precise human teaching intersection. So it's really actually teaching um, and not worrying about everything else. So that's a basic on the maturity scale. If you want to ask any questions, please do. All right, so my main takeaways and the analyst takeaways from 2021 are these. Let me just take a sip of coffee. I'm in California, so it's still early for me. So the K-12 market really we saw fractured into way more alternatives with far less traditional um, modeling of schooling. So the traditional model we used to think about with bells ringing and you know classes moving in groups and everybody's in a grade structure that is pretty much no more in its pure state. Um, so both administrators and, and teachers and the survey are interested in a delivery model shift. This is really big news. People are seeing that their response to the cultural shifts and what people want and need for flexibility is not really jiving with the old model. And they're leaning towards hybrid, high flex, which I'll get into in a minute, and blended and flipped. So those two are tied. Um, that's because competition really remains very high. I don't see it going away um, ever. And in 2022, it'll be just as severe as it was these last two years. So the market actually grew in EdTech spend less than uh, expected. We thought it was going to be much higher. But um, given the three stimulus bills flooding the, the market in K-12, but that's really because a lot of schools and districts really haven't gotten to spend all their money yet. They're not going to tell you that if you're an ed tech vendor, um, and they shouldn't. They're always going to act like there's no money and there's never going to be any money, but that's really not the case. Um, and really, we know that the, the stimulus is going to continue to be spent out, not just in 2022, but over several years, because it just it's that much money and it takes that long. The early stimulus in, in 2008 took five years to spend out. So. Purchase intention for digital curriculum remains really high at 63%. Hardware purchasing was up a little bit and is expected to remain stably much higher than it was in pre-pandemic. Um, the workflow and the elements of time and space and all the logistics stuff is what has our attention really riveted on that right now um, because it really remains mostly manual. It's an unseen thing by most schools and districts. They don't realize how manual they are in their logistics. So. Teacher-centric lesson planning is a massive hidden time cost, um, which lowers attention on students and is the real inhibitor of predictive analytics that would create a really full personalization for every student with a disaggregated pace. So um, also, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more too, but new types and new ways of offering PD are needed. So let's look at some of the data. So the pressure cited by administrators, number one, time and space. That was really wrecking people's plans um, in the last couple of years. Attrition of students, staffing problems, student achievement going down, um, the how hard it is to have an integrated tech model architecture. It's very complex. It's more complex in K-12 than literally any other market. It's just ridiculously complex. Um, professional development training. Then on the teacher side, student absences. This is still high. Um, you know, you have quarantine or go into quarantine and you're back and forth and somebody had an outbreak somewhere and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, time management, student engagement, um, simultaneous teaching. This has been a really hard, hard driving thing for a lot of teachers. Unrealistic administrative goals. Um, 
because a lot of administrators aren't expecting inspecting the workload. They're really not. Um, and then, uh, of course, student achievement as well. So those are the biggies in terms of the pressure side. And now here's what happened in the market. So in terms of the 56 million or so K-12 students in America, there were slight gains for traditional public school, which surprised us, due to new offerings such as online-only paths still within the district or school um, or attached within that by charters. Um, private schools actually lost some students. Um, part of that's the financial situation in America. Um, homeschooling went up by another 0.6%, but is not growing at a rate of 20% anymore. It's growing, it's slowing to about 10%. The estimate of pure traditional without at least offering some hybrid simultaneous um, is less than 50% of the market right now. Um, you really can't stick with a pure traditional model. It's not working culturally. 37% um, or 21 million students are opt-outers of the purely traditional model. They're either in public online only, charters, private schools, or homeschools. With another small percentage, the remote learners who are sort of like in the gray zone between physically they're on campus some of the day and then the rest of the day they're not on campus, that kind of oddity. So um, if you really look at this data, it's it's pretty alarming from a try to maintain your old model per, per view. And you know, we've heard a lot of the districts saying, we're going to go back to normal. Oh, no, you're not. There is really no more normal in the market. Um, and that I cannot stress that enough. So total K-12 market and tech spend in 2021 was up by another $2.2 billion. Um, hardware, major systems, digital curriculum networks, it, it includes all of that. It wasn't the $7.5 billion increase we saw in 2020, but it maintained that and went up another notch, which is... <laughs> is a huge notch. I mean, 2.2 billion is not a small number. So here's what happened with hardware. There was an increase of about 600 million or 3.3%. We expected it to be more. Um, it grew by 200 million more than expected, but not as much as we originally thought it would. Um, and an increase by 500 million for major systems. Those are your learning management systems, student information systems, the big iron um, software. And then digital versus paper. Paper went down again. Um, people aren't buying paper as much anymore. Uh, digital curriculum went up by 1.8 billion. We expected it to be a little bit higher, but it was an increase of, um, you know, pretty significant 1.6 billion overall in both um, curriculum resource areas. The consumer comparison is that um, K-12 now has got a stronger growth rate. It was only 5% before. It now has a 10% compound annual growth rate. The straight to consumer market, however, picked up hugely um, jumped up to 28.5 billion. Now, if you look at this slide at the very bottom, the global app market is was 582 billion in 2020, and we don't have the 2021 numbers yet, um, but it obviously grew again. Uh, the consumer increase was 5.7 billion. What I'm what I'm showing you this uh, for is so you understand that culturally, the United States American public is really. <laughs> aware of good quality software. They're buying apps at, at an enormous rate, double what K-12 does. Um, and that's telling you a lot of information about what people are expecting, both from their interface with knowledge, as well as how professional grade, they're expecting that to be delivered to them with really great user interface, user experience, because they're paying for it. Um, all right, so administrators versus teachers. This is where we asked about the school model. And if you're not familiar with the eight models that came out in our last special report, please go download that because you need to be familiar with the eight models because digital traditional with alternative scheduling, you know, Wild West um, odd, oddball scheduling is, is the most popular model being, being used. It's not the old school traditional model. It's still alternative with digital, but it's it's the one being most used, obviously. Um, but this is what administrators responded versus what teachers responded. What was interesting to us is that teachers, and these are different pots of, of teachers. They're not all aligned with the same districts, different teachers, sometimes different districts. Um, hybrid high flex was responded as more in use and hybrid con logistics contemporary, which is really the Uberization of learning was higher than we were expecting. Um, I don't know if it's full Uberization of learning or if it's just saying, yes, we're doing pace-based learning. 
Um, so that this is kind of what people responded. I think it's important to understand that the interest rate um, of what, what, what people wanted was these two. So if they're in a traditional model, this is what's of most interest to all the administrators that we surveyed, blended flipped and hybrid high flex. So hybrid high flex is that traditional grade class structure, um, but a carve out for totally individually paced um, materials or courses. So we have always had that potentially with uh, remediation time for students in their in their homeroom time, but now doing a larger section of that carve out and really making it individualized is really what people are interested in. Um, all right, so here's what happened with devices. Uh, this is the install right now with device deployments for tablets. 84% um, have, you know, between 100 up to 500. And you can start to see the bigger numbers up here. 3% have 6 to 15,000. Really large jumps in device deployments for tablets. Um, large jumps in Chromebooks, which are the favored device na nationally. You see 4% have between 25 and 45,000. This is why... Um, you know, a lot of uh, chip manufacturers, uh, they were running out of chips, couldn't make more computers. Um, laptops, also big numbers. Desktops, bigger numbers than we were expecting. Um, but these are typically in the administration side, sometimes at the teacher level. Device deployments for gaming, this is a huge number. So 100% uh, of schools and districts responding, they have um, anywhere, you know, between just a few, like under 100 up to 500 uh, of the high, high-end desktops for high-end work. Um, all right, here's where we're at with tech. So learning management systems, 74% in use, 6% considering. Um, interactive whiteboards, you can see all the data here. The interesting one to us is the social emotional systems, 44% in use. Um, plan to purchase more, 17%, 31% considering use. These are big numbers. So we're expecting that to sweep the market in 2022. Um, in terms of esports, live tutoring, motion tracking, video cameras, we were surprised how many motion tracking video cameras were already in the market. We're expecting that to be a runaway popular technology in the next year, um, with 18% uh, planning to purchase more and 24% considering use. You can kind of see these numbers um, in terms of how things are laying out. Learning object repository looks like a strong growth area, too, in terms of considering use. All right, so here we're, here's where we're at with planning and scheduling logistics. So you look at this chart and really understand it. The reason we're interested in it is because it's such a time waster for schools and districts. Um, a lot of what the work, the work being done by administrators is planning and logistics work. Uh, start times, end times, well, who's doing what course, who's in what room. It's mostly manual all the way up to the last column there. So uh, mostly manual just with documents is the first 27%. Uh, unconnected systems, meaning they're using man manual documents and then some standalone systems. The schools are all operating independently, so there's a lot of traffic back and forth between the district and the schools. And then some connected systems where you have maybe a universal student information system with universal rostering, but some software systems are disconnected. So you have back office personnel who are doing rostering all day, every day, constantly updating things. And then truly connected personalized system where every individual teacher and every individual administrator and even the students have their own personalized views. I, I suspect that that 21% maybe is higher than is true. Um, but that's where we're at with logistics. <clears throat> So the number of staff in the school or district and schools who work more than 50% of their time on logistics, 50% um, are reporting they have less than 10. But if you look at the numbers that we had from suburban and rural, that's understandable. Um, but they don't have that many people. Um, and then 21% uh, citing they have 10 to 50. That even seems high for any uh, suburban or rural, considering the numbers that, of, of respondents. And then you get all the way up into like more than 1,000 people. Those are the big districts usually responding. This is an important question to ask um, if you're an administrator right now. How many people are really, that's all they do is work on logistics stuff. <clears throat> Planning and execution for digital resources is teachers um, doing all the lesson planning, choosing all digital resources. This is the common default mode. This is really the old way of modeling how you will execute on uh, teaching and learning. You have an administration, 
and the teachers do everything individually for their subjects and their courses. Um, that is in question now because having a, a fully built uh, map of curriculum that teachers can then uh, not have to do so much traffic around, but they can just teach to that is really the mode we're seeing the advanced schools um, go for. I know that's a little flip and thinking, but um, the first three things here, the 39%, the 29%, the 21%, are still all the teachers doing everything individually. And if you think back, when textbooks were what we all adopted, um, that was the curriculum. And teachers then built their structured lessons around that. Every sixth grade math teacher uh, had the same book. Every uh, language unit usually had the same stuff. Every social studies, every uh, history class, they all had the same books. And then they built around that. When we went digital, we kind of threw all that out and we created an enormous amount of traffic of building, uh, finding, building, and then managing the back and forth traffic of everything, which is an unseen major burden. And I'm going to show you the data on that. So administrators estimating the number of digital content resources, 66% uh, um, say they have between 100 and 1,000 of all the different digital things they keep um, hanging around as an administration for the teachers to use. So that includes their professional grade repositories like Safari Montage, um, discrete learning objects, videos, eBooks, or sometimes big eBook subscriptions, um, the professional learning apps, and the, and the courseware. Um, you can see some, as, as many as 8% are reporting they have more than 20,000 of those things. They can be as high as several million, like Houston ISD has uh, several million in their repositories. Um, but we, we kind of surveyed at the low end of it just to just look at the market. Um, the teacher estimates of what they're actually keeping around on file in personal accounts that are not going into the group overall repositories. Okay, so they're not really shared. This is what teachers are doing individually. 66, almost 67% uh, are reporting they have between 100 and 500 of those. Okay, those are desktop level or personal uh, cloud file uh, holding, which means you don't have visibility to it as an administration. You might think that's okay, uh, we don't really need that, but I will tell you the ability to um, have other teachers easier, more easily share what one teacher has already made is lost. And also your operational continuity with predictive analytics is lost because you don't know what people are using to teach with. You can't measure it. Um, and so that now you can't really know what you can do with an individual child. Um, and so you can kind of look at all of these. You know, some, some teachers have, you know, over, over a thousand. Uh, the other responses in this part of the survey was, you know, like we have 10,000, like the massive number of stuff that an individual teacher keeps. If you lose that teacher, you're going to lose all the stuff usually um, that they that they put together. All right. So in terms of the character of lesson planning, what administrators cite and then what teachers cite is this is administration since 26% of teachers custom build their lessons on their own knowledge or their or textbooks, like they scan in scraps of little textbooks um, for lecture and assignment style delivery. That's still really popular. 13% um, use the open internet, social media. Subscription sites, 18% use approved repositories, 36% use some mix of approved materials and a lot of build their own pieces. That's that's per normal. That's what we used to do um, in the past. And then 7% coach students through existing online courses. Um, a median of only 6.7 teachers uh, nationally have 50% more or more of their lessons built out for the subjects they teach. So what that tells you is that there's a lot of flying by the seat of your pants going on. There's a lot of like, I got to give this lesson on something, something subject in the next 20 minutes. I got to hurry up and put something together right now. Um, that that maybe had been popular back in the pre-digital days, but now when you have to consider the distribution of it, the finding of it, the clicking on the link of it and the, everything else you got to do to move the back and forth, that really doesn't work in the digital realm. So just pointing that out. Um, all right, so when we surveyed um, three different questions, both sides, administrators and teachers, um, how much time do you spend finding digital lesson materials? How much time do you, time do you spend building digital uh, content and lesson sequences? And how much time do you spend on digital traffic? Let me characterize digital traffic for you. That's the back and forth of assignments, logins, telling students which content because they can't figure it out, 
uh, student and parent email, um, systems monitoring, got to log out of this system, go into that system, um, checking app notifications that are popping up, um, and things that are more distribution and administration function that are not directly instructing students live to help them understand something. Um, that traffic was huge. So what teachers say is obviously much higher than what administrators think is going on by their teachers. So uh, there is 24% of America's teachers that say they're spending over 30 hours a week on those three tasks, uh, finding, building, and then managing the traffic of. This is a huge cost. And the reason that the Learning Council has zeroed in on logistics and workflow and actually attaining a common um, a curriculum map that is reliable and viable. Um, so we also found in January 2021 separate survey that 74% 74, 74 of teachers are feeling overwhelmed or burnt out. Well, now you know why. Um, this is a huge load on teachers for the last two years. And we don't see it going away because like we just showed you, only 6.7% have even 50% of their lessons built out. All right, so here's the PD the teachers were saying they really needed. 82% um, saying they're having to newly teach online via video conferencing and other tools. So if there's that many having an issue with that, then maybe there's more training needed in that um, or some other sort of tweak. And um, having to do, having an issue with new apps and subscription sites, um, having an issue with emotional impacts, more training needed there. Um, having issues with change schedules, different times. So that's that time and space warp that we've all been experiencing. Um, that different use of spaces is at 62.5%. You guys can kind of read down the slide. And by the way, these are all downloadable um, in the event, so you can look at this data. And again, there's way more data that we actually have. We're just being very concise here, um, you know, to sort of speed you through it. All right, so how teachers prefer PD is delivered was, was surprising. The weighted averages, the highest ones were in-person workshops and library of documents and short videos, which and actually the number one was scheduled meetings with trainers and then those other two. So so what that tells you is just like um, moving student learning online, uh, the cultural push is towards precision just for me with one on one training. That's what teachers want too. Um, so the really wide, you know, let's teach everybody everything in one giant auditorium room isn't really working for people. All right. So which day disaggregated services do schools offer right now? 58% offer hybrid flexibility. So enrolled students can be partially or wholly remote. That's positive. It's moving in the right direction. 42% offer full core curriculum online courses. Um, they might not do that in a seamless interwoven way for online students. They do that as a separate stood up online school. 38% um, offer homeschool or major tests. This is a condition of which state you're in. Some states don't allow you to do anything for homeschoolers. Um, but if you can, then you can sort of pick up seat time on some of that stuff. 32% um, offer parent tech training. We're seeing a spike in this. We're seeing a lot of websites when we reviewed who was going to win on the survey, That because we have to look at everybody's website as we're looking at who's going to be chosen, um, that are actually have full columns or full tabs just for parents now. This is a really positive thing. Um, and parent tech training with videos, documents, workshops, summer camps, all kinds of parent stuff going on. And then, but only 18% offer live chat learning support. This is going to be expected in the future. You should start looking at live chat. Um, and then 15% offer homeschool learning content plans. We're expecting that to take off. If it's allowed in your state, um, just take over and help people. They can still be aligned with your district, but they never have to come there. Um, okay, so what's next is we'll be doing a lot of podcasts in, uh, in January, February. We might get some of them done in December um, on various aspects to go much deeper on all the rest of the survey data. So watch for those pods. You can listen to them on your way to work um, or in the evening. But we'll be leading discussions about how do you reduce teacher burdens through a holistic address to viable, fully built digital core curriculum maps. And how do you do it at a professional grade level? How do you start getting away from just like PDS? You know, this is kind of boring. Why are we doing lecturing still? 
Um, I mean, in many places, lecturing is still needed, but there's a lot of ways around all this stuff um, so that the teachers are teaching. They're actually eyeballing, even if it's on video, and helping individual students um, get it, right, rather than like hunting down stuff and digital traffic load. So disaggregated service offering, uh, offerings for public school appeal is another thing that we're going to be looking at. How do you do that? How do you make yourself still viable as a public institution or a private institution? Um, how do you balance student needs now that you've seen with the last two years that some students really excelled in the totally virtual remote model? They just loved it and other ones just had meltdowns and couldn't take it anymore and they need to be together with people. We have different types of humans out there and we learned something in the last couple of years um, that there are different types of humans and they can't all be like, you know, put in the same bucket constantly. It's, it's a systemic inequity to try to do that. And how are we going to be now as schools and districts to actually facilitate the fact that we now know this? Um, and then logistics technology. You can expect to hear a lot more from Learning Council as we zero in on logistics. This, this is a big deal. It's uh, overburdening teachers and we love teachers. So we want to make sure that they're able to teach and not just doing a lot of digital traffic things. So that project is coming up fast. Um, we're building that. If you haven't heard about it, you can sign up to be part of the, you know, discussions about it and hear all about it and get into it. Um, many, many districts have already joined the project. I think we had like five superintendents join in the first email we sent out.